Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the IGCSE Chemistry Topics. This is ionic bonding. We're going to begin with the simple terminologies. An ion is an atom that has gained or lost an electron or electrons. Atoms from group 1 can lose one electron. Atoms from group 2 lose two electrons. While atoms from group 7 gain one electron. Atoms from group 6 gain two electrons, so it can be one or more. Any compounds are formed between metals and nonmetals. That is true because metals have to lose to become cations, while these will become anions as they gain electrons. So I said already, metals lose electrons to become positively charged, which are the cations, and the nonmetals will gain the electrons to become negatively charged, and these are going to be the anions. So the cations and the anions are going to attract each other, forming ionic bonds, and now they're going to be called ionic compounds. So the definition is an ionic bond is the electrostatic force of attraction between a cation and an anion. And ionic bonds exist among ionic compounds. The periodic table can help us determine the charges on the ions. For example, elements of group 1 to group 3, when they do lose electrons, they become positively charged. And the charges correspond to the group in which they come from. For example, calcium is in group 2, it's going to be calcium. 2 plus, sodium is in group 1, it's going to be sodium plus, and so on. The charge is equivalent to the number of electrons that are lost or gained, and the elements of group 5 to 7 gain electrons to become negatively charged, so the charge is going to be equivalent to the number of electrons gained. Here we see those in group 1 become plus 1, group 2 plus 2, group 3 plus 3, group 5 is going to be minus 3, group 6 minus 2, and group 7 minus 1. Now there are other cations that are made from metals that are maybe transition metals. For example, you need to memorize or remember that silver is always Ag+, plus, meaning plus 1. Copper can be copper 1 or copper 2. So they will tell you in the exam if it's copper 1 or copper 2. Iron can be iron 2 or iron 3. Lead is going to be always lead 2. Zinc is always zinc 2+. Plus. And hydrogen is going to be H+, plus, while ammonium is going to be an H4+. Plus. This is the only non-metal cation that can be asked at your level. For the special anions, these include the hydroxide, you have to remember those, the carbonate, the nitrate, the sulfate, as well as the phosphate. Let's see how ions are formed. Remember we said cations are formed when the atoms lose electrons. So here we begin with aluminium. Aluminium has three electrons in the outer shell. And since we know the outer shell electrons are the ones that participate in reactions, to convert aluminium to aluminium 3 plus, those three electrons are going to be lost. And in the end, we can see the outer shell is empty. So it is aluminium 3 plus. On the other hand, we see nitrogen. Nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five electrons in the outer shell. It's going to gain three electrons in order to obtain a noble gas configuration. And these electrons gained are here. So it's going to be N3 minus. So when elements of group 1, 2, 6, and 7 always form ions, they are usually isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas. Some other special ions that don't form noble gas configurations include iron, like I said already, iron 2, iron 3, copper 2, there is zinc 2, silver 1, as well as lead, like we saw previously. The first ionic compound that we're going to look at is sodium chloride. Since this is coming from sodium atom and chlorine atom, the sodium atom, which has one electron in the outer shell, is going to lose that electron. And the lost electron is going to be gained by a chlorine atom that has seven electrons in the outer shell. And together, this is going to be Cl- and this is going to be an A+. But we represent them using square brackets. So basically, you see, this is the structure of sodium cation after losing the outer electron. So we position square brackets like this and put a positive charge on the outside to show that this is a cation. On the other side, we still put square brackets and then put a minus to show that one electron has been gained. So this is how we represent the ionic bond between sodium and chloride. You must put the square brackets and the charges on the outside of the square brackets. Going to the formation of magnesium oxide, in magnesium oxide, we need to form Mg2+. Remember, magnesium comes from group 2, so two electrons are going to be lost. And these lost electrons are going to be gained by the oxygen atom. Since it has only six electrons in the outer shell, we need two more to obtain the noble gas configuration. When this happens, 
magnesium becomes Mg2+, we can see the square brackets around the Mg2+, and the 2 plus charge. On the other side, oxygen atom gain two electrons to become O2-, minus. the charge is on the outside. So this ionic compound is magnesium oxide. Next, we look at the structure and properties of ionic compounds. All ionic compounds are giant ionic structures because they contain multiple ionic bonds and they are in a lattice in an orderly arrangement where many forces of attraction are seen as we can see here. This is an expanded version of sodium chloride. We can see the sodium and chloride ions in that structure. So the position of multiple ionic bonds explains why they have high boiling and melting points. A lot of energy is required to break down all these multiple ionic bonds and that is why the boiling points and the melting points are quite high. Ionic compounds do not conduct electricity in solid state, but when they are melted or in aqueous state, they do conduct electricity because in this state, the ions are going to be free to move while in this state, the ions are not free to move. Remember to conduct electricity, we need free electrons or free ions. If these are absent, then electricity cannot be conducted. So in the solid state, the ions are not free to move. That's why any compounds do not conduct electricity. But in this state here, electricity can be conducted because the ions are free to move. I've already explained about the melting and boiling points. So let me go to crystallinity. Any compounds tend to be crystalline. We saw already they have regular arrangement of the ions in the lattice. And because there are many, they can precipitate out of solution and crystals can be seen. Any compounds are brittle. So if a force is applied, the structure is going to slide over. And again, the way this is arranged uh, could be kind of misleading because the negative ions are going to be in between. This is because the structure looks compressed. In the actual ionic structure, cations cannot be together like in this manner because they will repel each other and the structure could break away. Because the structure is in layers, when a force is applied, it's going to slide over each other and the positive ions are going to be closer to each other. Repulsion is going to occur and the structure is going to split or it's going to break apart. The next one is ionic compounds tend to be soluble in water. This is because water is polar while ionic compounds tend to be charged. So there is going to be an attraction between water molecules and the ions within the ionic compound and the structure is going to be broken away in order to make the ions soluble in the water. Ionic compounds tend to be insoluble in organic solvents. And this is because any compounds are charged while organic solvents are not, meaning they are not polar. So there will be no attraction between the two and solubility is going to be hindered. So finally, we can look at the formula of some ionic compounds. For example, lead to oxide can be shown like this. To some of you who still have problems writing these compounds, you can be able to begin with the structure of the ions. We can say lead is going to be lead 2 plus and oxygen is going to be O2 minus. So this comes here and that comes there. We formed PBO. The twos are going to cancel out because they are similar and that is going to be how we get that. The next one is ion 3 chloride, which is Fe. This is going to be 3 plus and Cl minus, minus 1. This comes here, that there we produce Fe. You could say 1 and Cl3, but the one is insignificant, so it's going to be ignored. We just consider those higher than one. Then copper sulfate, this is going to be two plus and sulfur two minus. The twos disappear because they are the same. And in magnesium phosphate, Mg is going to be two plus because it's from group two and phosphate. This is one of those you have to memorize. This comes here, that there, so we produce Mg3 and bracket PO4, we put a 2. I put brackets because you do not want to have a 4 and a 2 together. It would be misleading. Somebody could think it's PO42. So we also need to look at specific endings like at and it. These appear if there is oxygen in that specific compound. And if it's it, it means this is going to be a negative ion consisting of a single atom. For example, chloride, oxide bromide, nitride, all those are going to be containing one single atom, while these ones are going to be containing oxygen like carbonate, phosphate, sulfate, and so on. That can help you understand how these are named. So this brings us to the end of this video, which is talking about covalent bonding. Thank you for being with us. 
Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.